All right, so this is module number 12. We're gonna talk about plant health and pest issues. It's again, early July, and we're starting to see some pests fade out and we're starting to see some pests show up. So what are we dealing with right now when it comes down to plant health? How can we tell our plant might be a little stressed and need some support? And what can we do in the way of pest management to try to support our plants? And so we're here again, uh, looking at the bed that we planted back in May. And we have a wide variety of plants, some of which are cool season, some of which are warm season. Uh, one of the pests that we've dealt with across Fairfield that I've seen in many of the gardens um, pretty frequently is a flea beetle. Flea beetles are a tiny little beetle. Just just a black little speck. They can vary. The spe there are several species of them and they can vary in color, but the ones that I've been seeing here are a shiny black kind of iridescent little beetle. Um, just tiny, like an eighth of an inch or smaller. And they eat little holes in your, um, they love brassicas. So your bok choy, oh my goodness, that just got turned to lace by a flea beetle. And so flea beetles have a life cycle where the larva or the, um, the first instar of the, of the insect consumes the root systems of plants and the organic matter, the detritus from plants. Um, the, the female flea beetle will lay eggs in plant material. They will overwinter and hatch out in the spring. And then the, the young little larvae, early stages of the flea beetle will um, start consuming organic matter, potentially the root systems of plants if the plants are a little weak or stressed. And then once they pupate into their adult form, they start consuming your plant. And so they're a double whammy. So many of the garden pests um, or pests, right? Some of so many of the organisms that do do damage to our plants in one stage actually have a beneficial stage in our garden. And I'll talk about a few of those. Um, so we as gardeners don't necessarily um, look into the full life cycle, look into the full complexity of why these organisms have shown up in our garden and what roles they're playing. Um, but that flea beetle is a decomposer, breaks down detritus, makes it smaller and um, helps build soil inevitably. But in doing so, it has a double whammy on our plants, below the soil and above the soil. So that's one um, pass that I you know, feel pretty strongly that I'd like to have not show up in my garden. Um, and it's hard, you know, beetles are one of those pests that your plants have to be really strong to resist, to not attract. Your plants need to be really healthy to be able to resist them. And so in the early season, when we are um, just getting our seedlings started or we're putting uh, transplants into the ground, the soil is cool. Um, depending on the health of our transplant, did they sit in their little pots too long? Um, you know, so many scenarios. So can't really say where the flea beetles came from. What, um, did they, were they in your soil already? Um, were they attracted there? Who knows? But what can you do about them when they do show up? And um, how long are they gonna hang out? And so they're starting to fade a little bit. They're kind of going away with the, with the early season brassicas. Um, they do really hit those um, bok choy, the <clears throat> tatsoi. They did hit the kales and such a little bit, but not so much, but eggplants. Oh my goodness, the eggplants just got turned to lace in so many gardens. And um, you know, one thing that you can do to help prevent that from happening is to utilize a product or it's, a, it's, a, it's basically ground up um, uh, diatoms. It's called diatomaceous earth. It's a really fine powder something you want to be careful with. You don't want to breathe it when you're utilizing it because it is just a micronized um, silica in essence, these little uh, sea creatures, diatoms. Um, what happens is that powder is abrasive to the exoskeleton of that beetle. Those 
those beetles have a waxy outer layer and that mars or scars that waxy outer layer and causes them not to be able to retain their moisture and so it causes them to dehydrate it's pretty awful way to go but it is effective um, diatomaceous earth you can get um, really inexpensively we'll have some in our resource center for the fairfield garden initiative participants it is something that you can apply um, pretty liberally but please do know that it is um, non-selective any organism that crosses its path whether it be an ant whether it be a flea beetle whether it be a a uh, butterfly, whether it be a bee, you know, whoever's crossing its path and has a, um, has a, a body that is susceptible to being marred by it will be marred by it. And so, you know, use it selectively. Um, it is a powder that you can put into a very simple, I meant to bring one, a very simple water bottle even, um, just like a, you know, a Dasani water bottle. Just put a pen, you know, a small um, drill bit size hole in your cap, empty the bottle, make sure it's dry, put diatomaceous earth inside that bottle, and then put the cap back on that just has that one single hole right in the cap. And then what you do is you just puff it. You spray it onto the leaf surfaces of your plants, the ones that are being affected. And the underside of leaves, you'll find out, tend to be a great place to find pests. It's got good shade for them. It's uh, good protection from any of the parasitic wasps or um, uh, predator insects that are coming to look for them. And so a lot of pest insects will actually um, attack your plants from the under leaf, underside of the leaf. And so that's a good place to apply the diatomaceous earth. You also could apply it around the base of the plant. It being a powder is no longer effective once it gets watered on rain or you're irrigating or watering um, and so you have to reapply it when it rains. Diatomaceous earth is again like I said it's not um, selective it's a you know it it, it doesn't uh, discriminate it affects anything that crosses its path and so it's great for a lot of different pests. Another pest that is just now fading away well it's not fading away um, it has been here for a little while we might see it start to fade a little bit because we're not so much in the brassica season. We still have our kales and our broccoli and our cauliflower um, producing. And so they'll probably stick around just a little while longer. They'll come back. I don't know what they're, um, you know, when they fade a little bit, but that uh, cabbage looper, the white moth with the two black dots, one on each wing, that cabbage looper is, or the cabbage moth is a, um, you know, in its, in its moth stage, in its adult stage, is a pollinator. It's out visiting flowers. In its larval stage is a little green caterpillar that eats holes in your cabbage leaves. And so they're not selective um, in what they choose, but they, um, they do, you know, they'll go for any brassica. And what you're looking for when you're um, searching for that particular pest is a single beige, a really light cream egg. You'll notice when you see that butterfly, it's flying around and then it'll, you know, go usually on the underside of a leaf and it'll, you know, deposit one egg, just one. And it's um, hard to see. You have to be looking for it, but it's a great way to, you know, get ahead of them is to check daily to see if you've got um, any of those eggs showing up on your plants. If you do, just scrape them off, smush them with your finger, knock them onto the ground, whatever you do, just go ahead and get rid of them. Um, if you have seen a couple of those little eggs and you've seen the white moth flying around, then know that you've got the caterpillars and they are going to be so small when they hatch. And so you're looking for just the tiniest little green caterpillar when it um, first emerges. So daily, you just check the underside of your leaves, you check the top side of your leaves. If you're starting to see um, holes showing up regularly in your brassica leaves, it's a good indication that you have them. I don't see here many of the, um, the larvae. What I do see here is wasps. And so whether it is, you know, your standard, um, you know, your standard brown wasp or the yellow jacket style wasp, those wasps are patrolling your garden. 
if you have habitat for them. And they, in order to have habitat for them, you'll find that you see wasp nests a lot in eaves or um, overhangs or doorways, anywhere where there's a bit of a, a rain and um, direct sun protection, the wasps will develop their nests. Those wasps will eat caterpillars so voraciously. They are wonderful helpers, wonderful pred predators. They are prowling. They're the wolves of your, um, or the coyotes of your um, garden. They are seeking out those, um, those caterpillars and will really um, go for it. And so in order to attract those wasps, you have to have a food source. And so there is this balance in nature. One, you'll have the pest show up and have it start to replicate and start to become a problem. And if you've got a habitat that is um, conducive to the predator showing up, you'll see the predator show up and start to take down those pests or the organisms that are, um, that are eating your um, plant. So that's the cabbage moth. Another really common pest um, that is going to show up, well, actually has been here since spring, we're talking about earlier season stuff, is your roly-poly. Some people think they're pests. I think they're the cutest little guys. They're, a little, they're in the shrimp family. They're a crustacean. Um, they have a body that's made out of chitin, just like a shrimp or a lobster or a crab. Um, and they play a pretty important role in our soil ecosystem. They are decomposers, decomposers and so they're, they're, they're taking um, plant material, whether it's high carbon or um, you know, more green, nitrogen-rich material, breaking it down into those smaller um, particles and allowing that to go into the next stage of soil development. And so your springtails, your uh, other mites are gonna come in, earthworms are gonna come in and utilize that uh, broken down plant material to help build the soil uh, matrix that is supporting our plants. And so they have a really important role to play. But in the spring, they can be a little bit of a nuisance because sometimes when we have plants that are um, perhaps maybe uh, really delectable to them, I, I see that they really love pole beans. Um, they will come through and just nip off your, um, your seedlings. I think there's also a health issue, a plant health issue playing into that, but I haven't figured out what exactly is going on. And so I can't speak to that, but I think that, um, you know, you have to have that little bit of a love relationship. You might have a hate relationship, but do love them because they just play an important role in our soil ecosystem and plant extra beans. And know that if you plant your um, transplants, if you opt to do some transplants, if your plant is a little um, more further along, uh, usually those plants don't get um, eaten by the roly-poly. That diatomaceous earth is going to um, hurt them. And so if that's your goal, that works. Um, another tool that I haven't spoken about that could be used on all three of these pests and many of the others I'm about to mention is neem. Neem is a, um, it's an oil that is extracted um, from a plant primarily grown in the subtropics, tropics, India. Neem um, has a lot of uses, but it is a great um, pest preventative. It, it doesn't kill, it's not a pesticide, it doesn't kill the, the insects, but what it does do is alter their reproductive viability. And so it's, it messes with their hormones. There's a chemical or a, you know, a, uh, constituent chemical in uh, neem called azadirectin. Um, you want to look for a neem product that is a cold pressed first, you know, kind of like you would your olive oil, first cold press. Get a cold pressed neem, um, make sure it's organically grown. Um, you want to make sure the azadirectin um, percentage is high in it when you, when you search for one, if you do. And know that neem is something that doesn't have a long shelf life. You need to store it in um, ambient temperatures, you know, in between that 60 and you know 78 degrees you don't want to let it um, get too warm it will um, start to lose some of its viability use it up within a year's time some say maybe two years um, the azadirachtin starts to lose potency but that azadirachtin is a hormonal disruptor and will prevent the insects from being able to reproduce in order to have that be effective you need to have that insect consume the neem and so you're spraying it on the leaf 
Neem being an oil, doesn't mix with water very well. You do want to dilute it um, according to the label on the product that you're purchasing, if it is a pure uh, cold pressed neem. So what I do is I allow my, um, my neem to reach a temperature, you know, in that 75, 78 degree range where it's pourable. When it's down below uh, 70, 65, it's um, solid at room, it can, you know, solidify. And so you allow it to become pourable and then um, you mix it to the label rate and just put a couple drops of Bronner's soap, Castile soap, in the bottle that you're going to use it with and commit a bottle to your neem. Um, it's a really strong smelling substance. It's very oily. Um, it will mess up your pump sprayer if you're trying to you know, transfer in between, in between, or you have to clean it really well, your pump sprayer. So try to commit a particular sprayer, pump sprayer, whatever, to your neem product. Do clean it well after you use it, but no, it's gonna get gummy. And um, use that little bit of soap, and that will help break that surface tension so that it will em emulsify and um, you can spray it. And again, you're gonna spray that outside of peak sun. It's really just not a good idea to spray any type of um, biological, um, or chemical, every, everything under the sun that you see around us is chemical. There is nothing that is not chemical. And so the word chemical is not a bad thing. Um, so if it, is, um, if it is being sprayed, make sure you're doing that outside of peak sun. And so do that uh, well before, um, well, and again, it, if it's broad acting. It is not selective. It's going to affect everything that comes in contact with it. And so if, if, if the organism that uh, comes in contact with it does consume it or it is transdermal to them, then um, they are going to have their reproductive system interfered with. And so that could be your bees, honey or native pollinators, bumblebees. That can be your spiders, your good um, supporter spider. It can be your wasps. Um, it can be your butterflies. And so I pull that one out, the neem, only in extreme cases. Um, but it is a, a very effective tool. I like to use it, you know, only when needed and spray it at night, I think is a better idea. Spray it in the evening when the bees are not out and um, you, you need to have the leaf coated <laughs> for that. They need to be able to eat it. That, that insect that's munching at your plant needs to be able to eat it. So you need to have it on the surface of your plant. All right, another insect that we're seeing right now, it is again early July, and um, the Japanese beetles are just starting to show up. And they are pretty voracious consumers. They will turn your plants to lace. I'm gonna show you an example of what a Japanese beetle can do. They like beans. They also like a lot of your perennial um, fruit and berry bushes, and so they like blackberry, they like plum a little bit, they like grapes, they really like grapes. These are some, you know, and that is certainly a plant health issue. Um, the beetles are harder to deal with. You need to have a plant that is all the way up into stage four of plant health. And if you're curious about that, you can look into John Kemp's work around the plant health pyramid. If you go to advancingecoagriculture.com, you can look in their resources section and there's a great um, video uh, webinar about the plant health pyramid. But <clears throat> they've very succinctly determined that um, the, the stage of plant health is really correlated with um, the metabolism of the plant, how it's cycling its nutrients into complex um, molecular structures of the plant. And so a plant that is in stage four of plant health, there are four stages, so that's the highest stage of plant health, is actually being able then to, to start to produce some of those more medicinal compounds, the essential oils, those um, phenolic compounds that are um, more pest deterrent. You know, they are actual chemical weapons for the plant. And so a plant, once it reaches that stage of health, it's already past being able to store some of the surplus as um, lipids. When you see a plant that is um, presenting with a shiny um, health, you know, a shiny surface to their um, leaf, a waxy, shiny um, leaf surface, that's an indication that they've reached stage three of plant health. Excuse me, and you don't see 
um, at that point, you're not going to see any um, of those leaf munching organisms usually. Well, you might see the beetles, but you're not gonna see the caterpillars. You're not gonna see um, the sap suckers. You're not gonna see the thrips. You're not gonna see the um, aphids on your plant. You're not gonna see uh, airborne bacterial or fungal diseases showing up on those plants. That's stage three when you have the lipids, you know, when plants are at stage three, they are able to take their surplus nutrients and store them as lipids or fats. And that's when that waxy, glossy leaf surface starts to show up. And that is a wonderful indication that your plant is also more resilient in the way of water um, preservation. When they have that waxy surface, you know, just like you, when you put on um, a lotion or an oil, um, it helps seal in your um, natural moisture level. Um, when, you know, anything is waxed, it has a natural um, uh, protection against evaporative moisture. And so they, they have an opportunity then to, to reserve their moisture a little bit better. They're not so susceptible to the wind and uh, sun exposure. They're a little more resilient. They're storing uh, extra nutrients and they are able to um, fend off more pests, but they're still susceptible to the beetles at that stage. So this guy is um, a bean plant that we planted back in, from transplant. And so beans are not necessarily, they don't, they don't like to be transplanted. A lot of plants don't like to have their root systems interfered with. Uh, baby uh, annual vegetables don't like to have their root systems interfered with. Beans, peas are two of those. Um, a lot of corn doesn't necessarily like to be transplanted. A lot of the cucurbits don't like to be transplanted so much. Um, their root systems are a little more um, tender. So this little guy was a transplant and um, it just fell a victim to some uh, Japanese beetle damage. It does look like uh, a little bit of a just laceifying of the, um, of the leaf. And so it doesn't happen all at once and it will get worse. The, the life cycle of a Japanese beetle is um, the, the adult, once it emerges in the late spring, early summer, that female will be able to lay up to, you know, 40 eggs or so in its, um, in its cycle. Uh, and so it doesn't necessarily lay a boatload of eggs, um, but it, it, you're going to start to see um, more and more of those emerge during the growing season. And what you want to do is get ahead of them before you have so many females that you're having a um, surplus of those eggs being laid in the soil. And they do lay those eggs in the soil. And so that um, larvae goes through its many um, larval molts in the soil, emerges in the late spring comes out, you know, late June, depending on the temperatures, and um, has a, a ravage of your, of your orchard or your garden. So you can use the neem. You can use the um, diatomaceous earth. Um, there are some other uh, tools that you can use, the predatory wasps. Um, you can use uh, predatory nematodes. That's a soil thing that will get the larvae. That's a little, uh, you know, uh, something that you can do later in the fall and that will help uh, deal with the issue next year. It's not really going to help you with your issue this year. <clears throat> also, one of, the, one of the best ways to deal with a lot of pests when they're first getting started is to be out here daily, just checking to see if you're seeing any of those um, cabbage caterpillars, if you're seeing the flea beetles. Flea beetles you can't capture, you're just going to have to treat for that, but the, the caterpillars you can pick off. The, um, the Japanese beetles you can pick off. And so just a jar, a little bit of water, a couple drops of soap to break the surface tension and they'll succumb to that. And what you'll find is that the Japanese beetles, um, usually you find them in pairs, they're usually mating, um, and they like to hang on the undersides of leaves. Um, and what will happen is if you go, if they see a shadow, if you put your hand to go capture them and grab them and put them in, um, they'll drop to the soil uh, or to the mulch. And so the best way to do that is to have your jar, and a wide mouth, wide mouth jar is great, or a bucket or whatever you've got. Put it underneath the area where that um, Japanese beetle is and then run your hand over like you're gonna grab it and they'll just drop right into your jar. That's 
a great way to get them. So that's the Japanese beetle. One other insect that's just starting to show up right now, early July, and well, it's two, but it's affecting the same plant, is the cat or the um, squash bug and the squash borer. Squash borer is so hard to deal with. The squash borer is a, a moth in its adult stage, and it looks like a um, red and black moth, kind of pretty, um, really distinctive when you see it. Um, and it lays one egg, one dark colored, I don't know if it's brown or black, but it'll be right at the base of your squash plant. And it, when that egg hatches and starts to bore into your squash, really it's just a gnarly thing. You, you, you know, you can try, you know, I've, I've tried for years and years to save squash plants once they've started to be bored into that, um, that grub, you know, it's kind of a grub, um, will just keep eating up through the vascular tissue of that squash. And so that vascular tissue or that, st that stem is how the squash is able to take nutrients from the soil and transfer it to the growing points and the fruit. And then that's also how the squash is able to translate its um, sugars, its photosynthetic, you know, photosynthates down to the root system to feed the microorganisms. That reciprocal relationship has to continue in order for um, the plant to stay healthy and alive. So um, I think a great way to deal with a squash borer is being mindful once you start to see that um, red and black moth show up. I'll put some on the Fairfield Garden Initiative page, I'll put some examples of these adult and um, larval stages or the impact so you can see what you know what you're looking for. But once you start to see that moth show up, um, be diligent, go around and just gently look around the base of your squash plant to see if you see a single um, black or brown dot. If you do, scrape it off. But honestly, um, the, I think the best way to deal with the squash lar or the squash borer is to plant extra and not be super attached. I think that's a good goal in general. Same with the, um, the roly polies and your beans or um, you know the cabbage moss and your um, bok choy. Plant extra. Just plant a little extra if you've got the space so that you um, might be able to tithe a little bit of that to nature and, um, and then you know, still get a harvest. Um, but with the squash borer, it, you would want to stagger. You want to successionally plant your squash. And so if you're looking for summer squash, these are all summer squash and they're a bush. Summer squash are generally a bush variety. And so um, you can see that these are young. These were only planted in um, June 11th. So they're just getting started. Um, the ones right here are winter squash and they are about two weeks ahead. So I think they were planted right at the end of May. Um, you would wanna stagger. And so maybe every two weeks, plant another round of squash and um, then you'll know you'll have squash. If you start to see your squash plant that looked beautiful yesterday and you come out and you've watered recently or it's rained and it just looks droopy and dehydrated and it's not able to be perky. Um, it's likely that you have a squash um, borer in your squash. Um, what you'll notice if you look at the plant around the base of the stem, if you see an injury, it usually is like a beige colored uh, wound that then has frass or in, you know, the, the, the excrement feces of the boar will start to accumulate around that hole and it'll just be like this beigey brown color. Um, if you see that, you then can make a decision. Is that plant um, already producing squash, ripening squash right now and healthy enough do you think to be able to withstand, you know, has enough structural mass to um, continue to feed itself and to feed the microorganisms? Then maybe you leave it for a little while longer so you can get some more of the squash harvested off of that plant. If you are dealing with a really young plant and it starts to show those signs, I would say go ahead and call that a loss. Pull that plant and honestly, you're gonna need to destroy that plant or um, find, the, find the grub. 
and deal with it. Or you would potentially have a scenario where it's able to finalize its life cycle consuming the rest of that one squash that you've just pulled and um, then be a trouble for you or your neighbor next year. So um, consider that when you're, when you're dealing with a squash plant. If it's, um, if it's a bora and you're having to pull, then um, think about what's gonna happen with that plant. Um, if you've got a uh, scenario where you wanna try to save it, um, I've seen where people have, and I've tried this, um, you know, used a really thin wire and um, you know, tried to seek out that grub and kill it um, you know, through the vascular tissue of the squash. You can also work with um, you know, more resistant cucurbits. And so your um, butternuts are gonna be a little more resistant. Um, some of the um, you know, butternut style squash are gonna have a stem that's a little resistant. And so basically a stem that is uh, more compact, denser, and not easy for that uh, small larvae to dig into and start to consume. And so stick with your butternuts if you're um, thinking about winter squash and then summer squash, just know that they can be planted pretty late. They're a short cycled annual vegetable. Just plant another round every two weeks if you're really attached to having summer squash and you've had squash bore issues in the past. Don't be afraid to do that. Um, and another insect that will show up right now, and I've always heard the, the indicator is when the comfrey blooms, or not the comfrey, but the chicory blooms, and the chicories just started to bloom in our area in the last week. And so I have just started to see the squash bug show up and see the squash bug eggs. So the squash bug is a true bug. It's one of those shield bugs. It kind of resembles the marmorated stink bug, but it's a little bit, it's not the same. It, it is a bug that has a, you know, it looks like that, but it's a little bit larger. It's not the exact, exact same color. Um, but what you do to look for those eggs, turn your leaf over. A lot of, a lot of the, they're smart. Insects are smart. They're gonna hide their eggs from predators and from sun, you know, so they don't get too hot, too dried out. And so those eggs are um, the color of, they can range from like a, beautiful golden to uh, a deep brown bronzy color. And so you're turning your leaves over and look in the crotch of the veins of those, and be gentle, you know, these, these are beautiful leaves and this is a gorgeous plant and you wouldn't wanna break those leaves, but do take a look and see if you can see a little cluster. It's usually gonna be anywhere from like seven to 20 eggs they're tiny, but they'll be all clustered together right in the, uh, usually in the, in the V or the crotch of the veins. And when you see that, you know, take an assessment. Is that leaf still vital? You know, all of these looks, leaves look really vital. This one is starting to look a little haggard. And so um, that would be a, that would be a um, judgment call for me. If I noticed the, um, the eggs right on the bottom here of this leaf, I would likely just go ahead and cut this um, leaf back to its, you know, closer to the stem. And then I would submerge this in a bucket of uh, a little bit of soap in water, the Bronner's a couple drops in a bucket of water, just submerge it there. And um, that'll take care of the eggs. You can do the same when you see the, the, <clears throat> the first um, nymph stage of that bug, they will be clustered just like the eggs. They'll stay clustered uh, right at that little crotch there where they hatched while they're um, you know, starting to do their first level of consumption. And you'll start to see the damage on the top of your leaf. It'll, you'll see uh, a browning of the um, leaf and then you'll start to see an actual uh, necrotic open. You know, they're starting to consume the leaf. So you can just cut that whole leaf off, submerge it in your bucket of water, leave it there just, you know, hours, days, whatever. And um, that'll take care of that first nymph stage of that insect. And then the adults you can just pick off and put in the bucket if you see that. You can also, you can also use um, the neem. You can use the diatomaceous earth for that as well. Uh, I don't know if there's a predator. I think the, um, I've heard that, I think the soldier beetle might um, work with the nymphs for that, but um, manual 
uh, picking is usually a pretty good way to deal with those. All right, I think that was all that I wanted to say when I was talking about pests and we went into the plant health in general, um, but just know that, um, you know, the, it's contextual. You know, different plants have different scenarios during the, during the year where they are their healthiest. And so chard is one of those plants that can handle the cool temperatures of spring and can handle the um, heat of summer uh, as long as they're staying well watered and well mulched. And then they can make their way all the way into fall. And if you mulch it over, you know, we're zone um, 5B, southeast Iowa, the, um, the chard will overwinter in some cases. And so will the kale. Um, if you mulch it really well, or if you're, if you have a bit of a row cover, if you're doing like a, um, a cold frame or row cover, I've had spinach, kale, uh, celery, um, arugula, pretty much all the brassicas over winter quite nicely in, um, just a, a thick row cover. And we're going to talk about row cover in just a little bit. So, you know, don't be afraid to treat these plants really well and try to keep them really healthy because they can feed you all through the year. Um, now, we're gonna talk about harvesting in just a little bit on how to do that to make sure you're keeping your plant healthy. Um, but I think this is a good example of a nice healthy chard plant. It's got a nice, um, <clears throat> this is another indication of health, is the, the presentation of the leaf um, having a lot of texture to the leaf. Sometimes you can have a textured leaf. <laughs> And it's not great. It's not a good idea. It's actually an indication of disease or deficiency. Um, but for a for a plant that is um, genetically designed to have a lot of texture to its leaf surface, if it's presenting that quite um, apparently, that's a good sign. Um, any little anomalies um, that show up in the leaves, you know, if you're seeing the um, the hairs on your tomato and your squash, just really nice well-defined, um, they're almost like little needles or little silica hairs. Um, that's a good indication that they're able to take up silica, which is a, a mineral from the soil, an element from the soil that is really hard for a plant to get access to, but needs in order to have good cell structure. Um, if your plants are putting on good, healthy growth, <clears throat> putting on good structure, but are um, <coughs> at the same time, keeping the internodes between the leaves close and tight together, that's an indication that they are able to take up calcium really well. So if they were just putting on their vegetative growth with either um, nitrate or um, potassium, they would have really, you know, they would build structure, but it would be lanky structure that wasn't strong. It would be structure that um, was stretched out and, um, you know, kind of weak. Uh, when a plant is able to get calcium, you'll see that that inter internode spacing, so the space between leaf sections, it stays tight. Somewhere where that's really important <clears throat> is tomatoes. And so tomatoes can get really um, lanky when they either are having really low light or <coughs> um, too much nitrogen or potassium too early in their life cycle. In order to put on good structure, they need to have calcium early in their life cycle. And that's a biologically um, delivered, they need to get that from the soil. That's the best way for them to get their calcium is directly from the soil. And again, it's not an easy element for them to get access to. It's, you know, it's got a larger atomic radius. It's a heavier element. It's just hard for them to get access to it. It's got a double positive charge. It's hard to pull off the soil um, exchange site. Yeah, so it, it takes a biological um, system to be able to get that flowing into your plants really well. So if you're seeing that short internode spacing, you're seeing a, a dense, um, stocky plant, um, that's a good sign of health. As long as the color is good, as long as it's not being affected by um, pests or diseases, those are all wonderful signs. One thing I wanted to point out here are these peppers. They're not loving it right now. And so these peppers went in, uh, in you know, May, 22nd and they are showing you know I don't think they're getting uh, getting adapted very well to the soil um, you know system here to the soil community here they need some additional help they are not putting on good structure their leaves are tiny that's an indication that there's potentially a zinc uh, deficiency or a zinc tie up here they're not getting access to that um, their internode spacing is not too stretched out but it's not great their um 
you know, they're, they're just not unfurling. They're not just showing a, a sign of being able to get that calcium, being able to put on good structure. And so I'm going to work independently with these guys to see if I can't get them to kick it into gear. They should be kicking into gear right now. It's the warm season. It's their season. And so being that these peppers are not putting on um, great structural growth right now, to me, it's not time for them to be making um, peppers. So when a tomato plant, when a pepper plant, when an eggplant is starting to flower, when it's still too small or it's not very healthy, it is basically determined, you know, this is the way I'm going to interpret this, that that plant has decided that its imperative is in danger. It needs to go ahead and try to make viable seed. And so that's <clears throat> for an annual plant and peppers are annuals here in Iowa, um, not so much in South America, they're perennial. We have peppers at our home that are several years old, seven, eight years old, because we, um, we keep them containerized. We dig them into the garden in the, in the summer or late spring in their containers, very large containers, and then we bring them in in the, in the winter and keep them um, in a dormant state, light, you know, a little bit of temperature um, regulation. We don't let them get too cold, but they're, um, they're perennialized in that scenario where their temperature is being regulated. Um, <clears throat> These guys are not gonna make it through the winter. They're not in containers. They are going to need to make peppers this season if I'm gonna find them to be successful. But in order to do that, I feel in this early summer stage when their structure is not adequate yet, I'm not gonna let them do that because they're gonna be putting all of their energy, effort, and nutrients into trying to make these peppers and not into their structure right now. And I would much rather them get healthy, strong, dense, you know, get developed, have leaves that are large, big solar panels. These are solar panels. This is how they create energy. That sugar that they're creating right there is energy for them. It's energy for the microorganisms. In order for them to build a great relationship with the soil, they need to have big solar panels. And so um, I'm going to support that uh, pepper plant to do that by working with its nutrition, working that out. But until then, I'm going to take off all the flowers and the small peppers so that it resets its hormonal decisions right now, puts more energy back into its um, structure. You can, you can kind of force a plant to shift its um, hormonal set when you do that. Say you've got a kale plant that keeps wanting to bolt and go to seed right now. Um, if you keep cutting back those stalks, those, uh, those flowering stalks, Eventually, it's going to give up, and eat. You know, the the actual plant um, structure itself has the ability to be making hormones, and so in those um, apical growth tips of a plant, that's where auxins are produced, and so that is going to cause that plant to have those long stretched out internodes. It's going to cause it to be um, more towards the 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 finalization of a life cycle. Ethylene will start getting produced, and that's a senescent hormone. And in the soil, in the root system, is where cytokinins are stored, where they're, um, I think, produced in the root system. And that is the hormone that keeps them in that um, shorter inner node uh, type of scenario. So taking off that above ground um, flowering stalk takes away that hormone. When you, when you cut it and you take it away from the plant, you're actually reducing the ratio of that hormone in the overall plant structure. And so you can do that and reset the hormonal balance of your plant. That's one way to help deal with a plant that's not quite um, ready to be making uh, full, you know, this, this plant is pregnant right now and it's just not ready to, to mature um, those fruits. And so we're gonna take those off. Yeah, so that's plant health and pests. Thank you.